Hallå? Ska vi köra igång, tror jag. Tiden går här. Jag vet att vädret gör att alla kanske inte har möjlighet att vara i tid idag. Eh, jättevälkomna hit, för att säga. Jätteroligt att se ett fullt armémuseum här igen. Eh, och eh, ja, vi har en spännande förmiddag. Och god morgon ska jag säga. Det är faktiskt morgon. Vilken morgon också. Med så mycket snö ute. Det hade vi inte planerat. Men det är vackert som många har sagt. Så vi får gå på det. Eh, och jag tänkte inleda lite här idag. Eh, och jag vill hälsa er välkomna här. Men jag vill också hälsa de välkomna som finns på, på vår Youtube-kanal nu. Eh, vi streamar ju alltid de här seminarierna. Så är det någon som vill titta på det efterhand av era kollegor eller så. Så går det jättebra på vår Youtube-kanal. Och jag tackar Bluefree som alltid hjälper oss med detta på alla ställen vi är och håller våra seminarier. Det är otrolig service. Eh, Charlotte Tyre heter jag, vd för IAB Sverige. Som sagt inleder här idag lite kort. Vi har en eh, superspännande agenda. Jag gissar att det är därför det har varit sånt otroligt intresse för det här seminariet. Vi har haft hundra stycken på en väntelista. Vi har aldrig haft så stort intresse faktiskt för våra sökseminarier. Jag tror det är femte året vi bjuder in till sökseminarier. Eh, som sagt, jättespännande. Jag tänkte inte gå igenom så mycket agendan. Jag gissar att ni har sett det i inbjudan. Men vi har, det är framtidens sökmarknadsföring som står på agendan. Och allt vad det innebär. Så, och som vanligt så är det ju en av våra taskforce som står bakom agendan. Och som jag alltid brukar säga att våra taskforce är vår ryggrad. Och absolut den viktigaste delen av IAB. Och det här, vi har tio aktiva taskforce just nu och eh, idag är det ju såklart vår taskforce sök som har satt den här agendan. Och vi har en ordförande, Lisa Wenström, som vi är väldigt glada att ha som ordförande. Eh, och jag vill såklart skicka ett stort tack till Lisa och hela taskforcen för det arbete de lägger ner. Och i år har vi verkligen varit produktiva skulle jag vilja säga, förutom det här seminariet. Så kommer vi faktiskt släppa tre verktyg också. Eh, Lisa kommer tillbaka sen lite efter mig här om gruppens arbete. Men jag vill ändå säga att eh, jag är otroligt glad att vi kan lämna efter oss alla de här tre verktygen för branschen. Eh, det är den stora sökanboken, den släppte vi förra året. Men det är en uppdaterad version nu, 2.0. Och sen är det även två produkthandböcker. Då, så en, en sö om sökkalendern. Och en som heter produkthandboken. Och vad jag tänkte berätta egentligen är att ni hittar de här på vår hemsida. Under standard och guidelines. Och ni kommer även få länka till dem i ett uppföljningsmejl efter. Och de som gör att vi kan vara här idag. Som jag alltid vill tacka. Jätteviktiga för IAB. Det är våra premium members. Och det är Ojala. Kan ta sig på och komskor. Eh, Microsoft, Adobe, Contcast, Facebook, Mediakompaniet, IDG och våra mediepartner Dagens Media. Stort tack till er. Vi har också fyra stycken som betyder väldigt mycket för oss och det är våra industripartners som gör att vi kan jobba långsiktigt idag. Och det är Chipstedt, Onier, MTG och Google. Så stort tack till er också. Och som sagt, vi, vårt seminarieår är faktiskt inte slut än. Vi kommer ha haft 3000 personer på våra seminarier under året, vilket vi är otroligt glada för. Och som sagt, det är inte slut än. Vi har ett till seminarium i december. Och det är en, faktiskt en tradition nu skulle jag säga, det är våra trendseminarium. Där vi bjuder in 12 trendspanare som trendspanar inför det kommande året 2018. Det här kan man anmäla sig till på vår hemsida. Det kommer gå ut, tror jag, en inbjudan idag faktiskt. Det är planen. Brukar vi uppskatta. Sen börjar vi året med, i januari med den digitala annonsaffären som också går att anmäla sig till om man vill det. Det blir ett spännande frukostseminarium. Och vill ni hålla er uppdaterade så vet ni det är vår hemsida, det är våra nyhetsbrev och det är våra andra utskick och våra sociala kanaler ni gör det i. Lite kort skulle jag också vilja nämna om vår certifiering såklart. Jag tror de flesta känner till att vi har en certifiering nu. Vi har ju haft, jag tror faktiskt 600 personer nu som har deltagit i vår certifiering. Och från kanske 65-70 bolag, vilket är fantastiskt roligt. Och det kanske inte alla har sett är att vi faktiskt lanserade en ny certifiering. 
eh, här bara för några veckor sedan och den kommer nu rikta sig till alla typer av professioner på marknadsavdelningarna och den heter Digital Media Manager. Så det blir vår tredje certifiering i det här programmet och så fortsätter vi såklart med eh, online säljare och Adops Campaign Manager certifieringen. Så alla de här tre går såklart att anmäla sig till och ansöka redan idag om man vill det. Och har man frågor kan man kontakta min kollega Mikael Lennstrup som fanns här utanför. Ja, nu börjar vi komma tillbaka till dagens tema och det är framtidens sökmarknadsföring. Och det tänkte inte jag berätta på för så mycket om utan det tänkte jag faktiskt välkomna Lisa Wenström upp här som får inleda. Tack, tackar. Jag ska se vad jag ska lägga dem. Eh, jättekul att se att det är så många som har kommit hit idag. Det var precis som Charlotte sa så var det rekordmånga som ansökte och få komma hit idag och vara med på det här seminariet. Och det är såklart att tycker vi är jätteroligt. Um, och det är kanske inte så konstigt att, att det är så många som tycker att sök är så intressant som det är idag. Um, därför att det har hänt så väldigt mycket under de senaste åren och söket har blivit allt viktigare i marknadsföringen idag. Så jag tänkte egentligen lyfta lite siffror för er. Um, jag ska se om de... Att lyfta, eller vi, vi ser hur pass viktigt söket har blivit. Uh, I IABs adex rapport som kom 2016, den kom innan sommaren i år, uh, så står Sverige som den näst mest mogna digitala marknaden efter Storbritannien i Europa. Uh, och trots det så ökade söktillväxten med 36 procent under 2016. Man, när man tittar på mognaden, den digitala mognaden så tittar, on, utgår man från online ad spend per capita. Uh, och den här siffran för 2015 var 35 procent. Så tillväxten är otroligt hög. Um, och om man ska jämföra då för att få en relation och förstå hur, hur, hur pass stort det ökar. Så om man tittar på Storbritannien som är den mest mogna digitala marknaden så ökade söktillväxten med 14 procent bara under 2016. Och genomsnittet för Europa är 13 procent. Om vi ska prata lite mer siffror så vill jag också gärna lyfta att söket i Sverige står idag för 26 procent av den totala medieinvesteringen. Och av de digitala investeringarna så står söket i Sverige idag för ungefär hälften av alla investeringar. Så att söket är väldigt viktigt och stort idag. Det är klart att ni är här, eller hur? Dagens organisationer står inför stora utmaningar i och med all den mängd data som kommer, nya tekniker och automatiseringen. De flesta medieköp behöver ställas om och organisationer behöver också ställas om och förändra. Man behöver förändra sättet man arbetar på. Människorna som arbetar med marknadsföring och hela organisationen behöver förändras och anpassas till en ny datadriven organisationskultur. Men det är ju vi på söket väldigt glada för. För vi ligger ju steget före. Ehm, för att allt inom sök är redan datadrivet och 100 procent digitalt. Så det är därför som vi har valt att låta data stå som, som den röda tråden eh, på dagens seminarium. Ehm, caset som Jannica och Niklas kommer att presentera eh, kommer visa hur verktyg kompletterar oss människor och på ett smidigt sätt underlättar hanteringen av sökdatan. Alicia från Google kommer att guida oss genom attributionsdjungeln med fokus på datadriven attribution. Kända från i Prospect kommer att lyfta den nya typen av sökdata vi har att förhålla oss till när voice search blir verklighet. Och Perna från Microsoft berättar om hur chattbotter och visuellt sök ersätter tidigare behovet av landningssidor, appar och webbsidor. 
Den är, så nu har vi startat lite senare än vad vi trodde från början. Vi har en tradition här på sökseminariet att du brukar dela ut ett pris för bästa fråga. Och det vill vi såklart även göra i år. Däremot så tänkte vi försöka skjuta frågorna till slutet. Då skulle det vara så att, att man behöver gå. Så tar vi frågorna i slutet istället. Men som sagt, vi uppmuntrar till att man ställer frågor. Passa på när vi har experterna här. Bra. Då kör vi. Niklas och Jenneke, välkomna upp. Då hörs jag. Bra. Jag kan börja med att presentera mig själv. Mitt namn är Niklas Lind. Jag har jobbat på iProspect med ungefär två och ett halvt år. Tidigare har jag jobbat med sök i ungefär sju år och de senaste två åren jobbar jag väldigt mycket med dubbelklick och implementera plattformen då för våra kunder inom Rensunätverket. Och jag heter Jannik Tibell och är sökspecialist på iProspect. Jag har jobbat på iProspect i ungefär ett och ett halvt år. Och innan det så jobbade jag på ett kinesiskt e-handelsföretag också med SEM. Grymt. Elianten. Um. Det är ganska kul för vi gjorde presentationen i PC men på Max shrinkade den ihop, men ja, det ser ganska snyggt ändå. Eh, bara för att ge en kort bakgrund om Eleganten. Eh, de har ungefär 20 000 produkter i sitt online-sortiment. De har ungefär en tillväxt på 20 procent year over year i online revenue growth och så på de digitala e-handelsbilarna. Och de har ungefär 165 butiker runt om i hela Sverige. Så det vi gjorde när vi började arbeta tillsammans med Egeliganten är att som jag nämnde, de har ett otroligt stort, in, stort inventory på ungefär 20 000 produkter online. Uh, och det vi gjorde då är att vi tillsammans med kunden gick igenom på hur kan vi strukturera feeden. Och feed är egentligen ett, ett sätt att presentera för oss som jobbar med sökmarknadsföring vad som finns i online-sortimentet. Så det som finns på sajt återfinns även i vår semannons. Så det vi gick igenom var just att olika typer av stockväl, jag kommer gå igenom på det också. Men även hur vi ska presentera vår annonstext sen när användaren söker på produkter som Eleganten säljer. Vi har även Marketing Technology. Den teknologin vi använder för att bryta ut och strukturera upp feeden i de olika typerna av elementet som jag kommer visa här. Så först då, det vi gick igenom det just stock value. Det är ganska intressant att ha med egentligen just, finns produkten i sortimentet? Finns det bara tre produkter och mindre, det kanske inte är värt att annonsera för ni i sökannonsen. Då kan vi i så fall pausa, så det är ett otroligt bra sätt att automatisera och låta maskinen göra det jobbet som vi kanske inte riktigt hinner med nu 20 000 produkter. Så en arbetsförbedelning, en ganska smart arbetsförbedelning mellan människa och maskin då. Så finns det mer än tre produkter så går annonsen live när användaren söker på produkterna. Den genererar även sökord så vi kan på ett snabbt sätt få bygga ut vårt konto. Så när ett ny produkt lanseras hos Elganten i deras inventory så får vi även väldigt mycket sökord kopplad till den här produkten. Och som vi har inom målsvingar, det är pris egentligen. Och det är också en sån här väldigt bra grej att vi kan fida in i våra annonser så att förändrar Elganten sitt pris på sin sajt förändras det även i annonstexten. Och på så sätt är vi extremt relevanta mellan vad användaren letar efter, vad vi kommunicerar i annonstexten till de får vad faktiskt får för prisen på själva landningssidan. Vi har även med Manufacturers, vilket är den som producerar produkten. Och I det här fallet har vi Sonos som ett exempel. Och Categories, det är ju kategori att det är en högtalare då. Så det vi gjorde var att liksom ta med alla de här olika typerna av egenskaper. Vi vill ha att feeden det ska presentera för användaren och även vilken intelligens den ska ha som stockvälje. Att ladda in det är ett verktyg eh, som vi har tillsammans med vårt holländska kontor där vi egentligen sätter olika typer av regler och inställningar på hur vi ska strukturera filen och sedan presentera för slutanvändaren. Så det är väldigt mycket regelsättningar eh, och hur vi bygger vår kontostruktur på ett smart sätt. Och så här ser det ut som ett exempel i slutändan då att det blir extremt hög relevans när användaren söker på Sonos högtalare. Vi kommunicerar även priset. Och vi länkar direkt in på produktsidan, så vi gör det väldigt enkelt för användaren att komma direkt in på landningssidan. Som ett exempel, eh, om det går att se, eh, inom målsvingarna så har vi Manufacture, en category name. Då är det även pris. 
Så när användaren söker så byts det här ut beroende på eh, vad det är för produkt man söker efter. Vi har ett pris på våra sådana söktalare. Skulle användaren söka på något annat så är det fortfarande samma statiska annons som vi har. För vi har ju alltid runt två till tre alternativ i vår annonsgrupp. Men själva det dynamiska inom målsvingarna, det byts ut då för att matcha sökfråga och länka direkt in till det relevant ländningssida. Så med det så lämnar jag över till Janek som kommer gå igenom på resultat och utfall av det här. Okej, okay, så i och med att vi alltid utgår från det som finns i feeden så visar samma information i våra annonser som på sajten. Och vi matchar då vår annonsering med lagernivåerna. Så om det är ont om en produkt eller om en produkt är slutsåld så kommer annonserna för den produkten automatiskt att pausas. Så på så här sätt så undviker vi både onödiga annonskostnader och negativ en kundupplevelse. Vi kan på det här sättet fördela arbetet på ett bra sätt mellan verktyget och konsulten så att konsulten får mer tid över att fokusera på strategin. Genom att vi på ett effektivt sätt har kunnat skapa fler longtail sökord som har en lägre konkurrens och samtidigt genom våra mer relevanta annonser har en högre quality score så har vi lyckats sänka vårt kost vår CPC. Och den minskade konkurrensen har också tillsammans med mer relevanta annonser gjort att vår konverteringsgrad har ökat. Och det här har då tillsammans bidragit till en ökad ROI. Um. Här är då en jämförelse av intäkterna för de generiska sökorden innan och efter att verktyget implementerades. Och i den svarta stapeln så är det intäkterna augusti till oktober 2016. Och i den gröna stapeln som ni ser betydligt högre så är det intäkterna augusti till oktober i år. Och totalt så har intäkterna ökat hela 182 procent. Och det trots att vi bara har ökat investeringen med 83 procent. Vi har dessutom 10 procent lägre CPC. 36 procent högre konverteringsgrad. 177 procent fler transaktioner. Och 61 procent högre ROI. Super, tack. Fick vi ett verkligt case till att börja med här nu och eh, vill tacka Jannicke och Niklas för det. Så fundera ut om ni har en fråga till Jannicke och Niklas på slutet. Fundera ut dem redan nu tror jag. Det är nog bra, annars glömmer man bort. Eh, so now I would like to welcome one of our international guests here today. I'm very honored to have you here, you. Alicia Moonson, attribution specialist from Google. I know you've been working with Twitter too before and you, a lot of research, I guess. Yes, that's right. So we really look forward to your presentation. You will talk about attribution and how you get customers into attribution methods. Excellent. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today and thank you for letting me speak to you in English. Ever since I moved here four months ago, I've been amazed how accepting everyone has been and uh, understanding of my challenges of, of embracing and learning Swedish quickly. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about the future of search measurement. And when I started thinking about uh, this talk uh, and what's important today and how it has changed uh, over time, I reflected back on the time when I joined the measurement community. And that was at the time when marketing wasn't yet digital. Digital media was not part of the equation of measuring media performance. And I would argue that we probably lived in a far less complex world back then. It fe feels like things were a lot simpler. But when marketing went digital, we became challenged. And by we, I aggregate marketers and measurement specialists alike. Because first and foremost, digital media brought new kind of data 
for the first time we were able to look at interaction with media at a user level. And quite frankly, I think a lot of us didn't know what to do with it. We had to reinvent the textbook for measuring media performance. And it opened new possibilities. Suddenly we could group users in a very different way, run sophisticated A-B tests. But how do we reap the benefits of this richness from digital media while also looking at media performance holistically offline and online alike? And the second challenge came about when media went from online to mobile. Now suddenly, the paths to purchase has become increasingly com complex, and we had to think not just cross-channel, but also cross-device and make sure that link is, is there. And while these trends aren't new, they persist, and it's important for us to monitor them, react to them, and plan for them. Um, it really feels like change is the only constant, and Things, even in the internet world, they continue cha changing. Their, the internet population is growing, the usage becomes increasingly daily, and internet is now becoming mobile first. Equally mobile or mobile first in some instances. The blue line is this chart shows the share of users who are desktop first, and uh, obviously it is, it is going down. Um, Mobile is becoming increasingly important in a path to purchase. This is a US uh, number, but it does reflect uh, many markets dynamic where there is a significant increase of the number of mobile searches for where to buy. Uh, and again, triggering the thought that, wow, we need to capture mobile accurately in whatever measurement we uh, deploy. And capturing mo mobile has been a challenge for, for many organizations uh, and ma many companies uh, because too many reporting systems don't give credit or don't capture mobile path correctly. Uh, so in the instance where a user saw uh, a couple of desktop ads and then a display ad on mobile device and then searched and went to the store, they bought something, the last two touch points are going to be omitted. Fortunately, we've solved this because we benefit from seven Google properties with over a billion users, and using the data from logged in users, we're able to model the logged out users with a 95% or above confidence and bridge this path. And we only do the modeling to extrapolate to logged out when we have enough data. We never surface this data when we're not confident. But even with these advances, when we look across the industry, we see the same challenge over and over again, that we have legacy measurement practices. Traditional media is still measured to reach. Digital media is still measured to last click. And most importantly, uh, frequently, we don't see a connection between how media is measured and the very business objectives that it's intended to deliver. Let's face it, we don't run media to just get the reach. We run media to change consumers' hearts and minds and to compel them to action. Measurement remains a challenge for many marketers. Uh, a marketer recently posted that three quarters of marketers consider measurement and attribution uh, the, the source of their uh, utmost attention. But fortunately, we have a solution. Why? Because we live in a digital world with better than ever data and with better ever computing, computing technology. 90% of total information that was created in the world was created just two years ago. And today, processing power of computers is over 600 times greater than what we had five years ago. And because of this, we're able to deliver unprecedented insight. Why? Because we're able to siphon through millions of unique paths to purchase and create a bigger picture. It's a little bit like seeing the forest for the trees. Individual user path doesn't necessarily carry interesting information, but when you look at the, all of them together, you start understanding how uh, media performance works. And that's precisely what allows us to get to fractional data-driven attribution. It's fractional because it gives a portion of a credit for a purchase to a touch point, to a media channel that led to that purchase. And it's data-driven because there are no human assumptions in how this works. Data uh, is analyzed for every specific brand, for every specific campaign, and helps paint the picture of which channels 
uh, are stronger than others and what role they play along the consumer journey to purchase. I'll tell you a little bit about how it works. Um, at the crux of it is ability to compare nearly identical paths to conversion and the results, uh, resulting conversions. So in this instance, we have a path to conversion above with, let's say, conversion rate of 20%, and we are comparing it to a nearly identical path to conversion. The only difference being, now we have a video interaction that we didn't have before, and the conversion rate increases to 5%. So the data-driven attribution would infer or would figure out that there is an incremental 5% increase in conversion uh, propensity because of this video. Uh, and of course, there is more complexity than this. This is a, a simplified example. There are multiple considerations, including sequence of touch points as well. The same video could have a different incremental effect if it's sequenced after a different touch point. Uh, and the model normalizes across all of these variations for a complete view. Data-driven attribution is not new this year. We, we launched a product last year specifically for search, which I'm confident you're all aware of, uh, being search uh, specialists. Uh, we have data-driven attribution both in AdWords and DoubleClick, and over time we've seen uh, an increased adoption of uh, this solution across our clients. Uh, I think today we have 4,000 plus of advertisers worldwide that use it. Um, and on average, we see that uh, there is an increase in conversions of about 5% as a result of using data attribution. And these conversions cost this uh, as much or less than uh, in the historic performance view. And while 5% may not seem like an enormous impact, what is important to remember, it's average across a wide variety of different types of businesses. Individual results can vary quite a lot. We've seen results uh, as high as up to 86% increase in conversions, 40s, 50s, etc. Uh, but what we more typically see is an um, uh, increase of double digits um, uh, in, in the European markets, uh, as in this example here uh, from Berger Mir, uh, where we saw an increase in, c in conversions by 25% with a lower cost per conversion than before. Uh, so this is where we've been with measuring digital media, uh, starting really with search. But what do we do from here? How do we solve from the cross-channel world? Uh, where we're going is to uh, a single measurement solution as the single source of truth by ingesting capabilities from multiple products that exist in the Google stack, everything from AdWords to DoubleClick to Google Analytics. I'm sure you've heard of our new product, which is called Google Attribution. It launches next year. It is currently in beta. This product uh, is cross-channel, cross-device measurement that is integrated with bidding so that data becomes insight and becomes action. And most importantly, it is going to be available for all advertisers free of charge. Uh, there will be two tiers of this product, however. There is a, the free version will have most important essential capabilities and the enterprise version of it, which is called Attribution 360, will have enhanced capabilities such as including TV modeling and optimization into, into this uh, uh, solution. Uh, and it's going to be launching a little bit uh, later than the uh, general uh, product of Google Attribution. Uh, so what will this look like? This is a screenshot of a demo account, uh, and I recognize it's a bit difficult to see from the back rows, but uh, what it shows are channel groupings that are standard channel groupings, uh, last click view of performance in terms of attributed conversions revenue, and data-driven view of performance, which are going to be different attributed conversions and different revenue, and then they change. How does this change versus last click? Uh, and you can compare data-driven to a different type of model if you're using, um, for example, um, position-based modeling or a different version of the model. The control panel will allow uh, streamlined modification of the view, but the entire solution is uh, very much standardized. This is precisely what enables, uh, enables us to offer it to all advertisers 
uh, free of charge by streamlined essential features. Uh, but uh, there, it's not just a report. It is a view that is designed to trigger action uh, because it will be integrated with our bidding uh, products in AdWords, DoubleClick, um, as well as via API. And just to give you a sense of the type of impact it can have on a business, one of our early testers of attribution products has been HelloFresh, which is a home food delivery uh, uh, program in, in the UK and I think a couple of other European markets. Uh, and HelloFresh uh, tested Google Attribution and they were able to increase their conversions by 10% at the same and or even slightly lower CPA than before. So we do think that this particular solution will change how search uh, will be measured because finally you will have context for other channels. It was a great strong first step for us to enable data-driven attribution within search. But uh, I think we can all acknowledge that information and um, bidding uh, will be richer when we include more signals from the entire uh, user path. And just to paint the picture to you what it will practically mean in our field, um, it's, it's really like this. It's like the, in the olden times when Slatan was on the team, right? Like everybody in Sweden loves Slatan. I learned this in the first week of being here, just from you know, casual conversations. And it feels to me, to, as an outsider, that Slatan might be, have been getting a lot of credit that could have been given to some of his colleagues, right? There is a reason why you don't have 11 strikers on the team. You need everybody on the team to, to play their own role and uh, drive the result overall. But Slatan is the one who got all the commercial deals, who got all the fame and glory. And I posit that this is because there just isn't data-driven attribution in sports yet. I feel like that should be next, right? <laughs> And look at, what, at what's happening today. Slatan is not on the team. Swedish team was doing great. And that is because it's, it's never a sole player performance, right? It's, it's like last kick shouldn't be getting all the credit in, in football. So if I leave you with just one thought, uh, let it be this. Think about data-driven attribution, how it's going to change your job, how it's going to free up your time potentially from doing uh, some of the analysis manually. What will you do with that time? What strategic value can you bring to your organizations? And um, think about what's next really. And we love hearing uh, requests and uh, thoughts from advertisers across the field. And we love taking them back to our product teams in, in California. And we love being smarter because of your fantastic thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was very interesting. And again, if you have any questions for Alicia, save them for later. Uh, so, we have our next international speakers. It's fantastic. It's a very international morning, this. And we're very proud to have our next speaker here, too. She's a Global Chief Strategy Officer from iProspect. She's been working with digital marketing for 12 years, I've been told. And uh, she's, uh, yeah, she's going to give us the latest trends when it comes to digital assistance and voice search. And she will talk about the future of search. Welcome, Shanda. Thank you. I noticed Charlotte didn't try and pronounce my last name. That's very wise. I saw her deliberately skip that, but I wouldn't try any Swedish names, so we're equal. Um, every 10 years or so, something new comes along that disrupts how we think about technology. And 10 years ago, that was the mobile, and mobile brought with it the internet in our pocket and constant connection. And we're now on the verge of the next great disruption in technology. And this time, it's characterized by bots, AI, and machine learning integrated into pretty much every platform and pretty much every single thing that we do focused through the lens of a digital assistant. We were about to hand over our entire lives to an intelligent agent that sits in a phone that's in our pocket. 
or to an intelligent agent that sits on a device in our smart homes or sits on a device in a car. We're about to hand over our entire lives to something that sits in almost every platform that, that, that we interact with. And before we think that this is something that's way out there in the future, it'll never really happen like that, already in many markets, for example, US, UK, digital assistants are use, being used pretty extensively. We use a digital assistant like Siri, for example, to tell us what will the weather be like in Stockholm. She was wrong today. She said it wouldn't snow. We use a digital assistant to help us get directions, or we maybe use a digital assistant like Alexa to help us turn on and off our lights if we're too lazy in our homes. So we're already using digital assistants, and in fact, over 700 people use a digital assistant already today. And that's expected to skyrocket to 2 billion by 2021. And if you think about that, that means that almost the vast majority of the developing world will use a digital assistant within just the next few years. And this trend is being driven, I'd argue, mostly by the PR that we see around Internet of Things devices. So we all read about Amazon Echo device and the Amazon Dot and the Google Home device or Microsoft's Cortana speakers, and they're driving this particular adoption and, and, and usage of digital assistants. Well, that's the hardware. Those are the actual devices. What's actually more important is the assistant itself. And assistants are what's really critical for us as marketers to understand and to think about. And when we talk about digital assistants, we're essentially talking about voice. Either voice in and voice out, where I ask my digital assistant a question and she answers in a voice-related context, or voice in and visual out, where I ask my digital assistant a question and my digital assistant, she or he, gives me a variety of options to look at. So voice is what we're talking about when we think about digital assistants. And digital assistants are not just some new connection touch point that we as marketers have to think about. It represents a fundamental change in consumer behavior, and we need to think about that. And it's great, gaining traction pretty fast. And before you say, well, you know, it's all those young kids, those millennials, they're the ones that are using all these things. Yes, millennials are using digital assistants quite extensively, so 66% use a digital assistant regularly, but look at 60 plus and 70 plus, almost 40% of them use digital assistants. And the reason is because it's easy to use. There's no technology to get to grips with, nothing really to download. I ask my digital assistant a question, and she or he tells me the answer. And so we're seeing a greater number of users using digital assistants across all age groups. Oops. We also note that when people use digital assistants, they're more likely to do more of their purchasing online. So digital assistants are likely to herald a greater influx of e-commerce into online properties and a move away from store, particularly with younger audiences. So digital assistants are important. They're growing. They're going to be here. So we have to understand how can we use digital assistants? And there's some challenges inherent in use of digital assistants. First of all, from a search perspective, we're not really clear how it's going to play out. It's very easy to see what is the search opportunity for marketers in desktop. We understand the difference between paid and organic search or in mobile. But when it comes to voice, we're not really clear yet how that environment is going to play out. However, we do know that where consumers go, Advertisers are likely to follow, and uh, I think this is Jupiter Research estimates that we're going to see significant increase in ad revenue in, uh, in voice. So it's really important that we understand how we can use voice. <clears throat> Secondly, the ecosystem is a little bit complicated, and there's some inconsistency in terminology. Essentially, there's four main players at the moment in this space. Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Amazon. They're at the moment the key players. I'm sure there'll be others. And there's others, of course, in, in uh, Asia-Pacific markets. And each of these companies have built digital assistants or developed digital assistants. So Microsoft has created Cortana. Apple has created Siri. Google has created the very creatively named Assistant. 
and Amazon has created Alexa. These are the hardware, and then the digital assistants are essentially the software. And those digital assistants can live in any number of devices. So your digital assistant doesn't just live in one device. So your digital assistant can live in your Amazon Echo that sits in your home. Your digital assistant can be PC-based. So for example, Cortana that comes built with Windows 10. Or your uh, digital assistant could be a mobile app. So for example, you could download your Google Assistant in an app and use it on your smartphone. And finally, your digital assistant can be native to your mobile environment, to your smartphone environment. So that's, for example, Siri on your iPhone. And that mobile environment is represented here by the, the white bar at the bottom and actually represents the greatest opportunity. That is where most consumers use a digital assistant because it's native, there's nothing to download. So although we hear an awful lot about Amazon and the Echo and all of these devices that will sit in the home, actually it's likely that the greatest adoption of digital assistants will be on your mobile phone. The third challenge we have is that we actually don't know very much about users and there isn't a lot of data. So we don't know what does a Siri user look like versus an Alexa user. We don't know what consumers do when they move across devices. So am I using Alexa with my home device and then do I switch to Google when I go to my mobile phone or do I switch to Siri? We also don't know what's likely to happen in the future. Am I likely to stick with just one digital assistant and try and use that across all devices? A lot of unknowns still. And then lastly, we've got virtually no research, virtually no data. We're getting more, but really research is limited. So there's limited insights for us at the moment. So what can we do? How can we solve some of these challenges? I think the first thing to do is to come to grips with what are we talking about when we talk about this environment? So what do we mean when we talk about digital assistance and voice? And essentially, there's three components. There's the device. In this case, we're looking at the Amazon Dot. But also, as we said, your digital assistant can live in smartphones as well. Secondly, there's the assistant. And in Amazon's world, that's Alexa. And your digital, digital assistant can do lots of things for you. One of the things I love to do is just say, hey, Siri, read my emails. And Siri reads off all your emails in a very bizarre voice. So, did you? Oh, that you woke up, sorry. <laughs> and then lastly, and probably most importantly, are bots. In Amazon's ecosystem, bots are known as skills. In the Google ecosystem, they're known as actions. Always we have to have these different words to make it extra complicated. But essentially, they're all the same things. It's bots are a piece of technology that allows the digital assistant to do its job. So when the digital assistant is asked by a consumer, find me a cheap flight from Dublin to Singapore, the digital assistant goes off and queries the Norwegian Airlines bot, as it happened yesterday, Norwegian Airlines bot, and finds me the information. And bots are going to become increasingly important because bots are effectively going to become the voice of brands in bringing information to the digital assistant. The second thing we have to understand when we think about the landscape is who powers what? Where does search come from? Where does all this information come from? So Alexa is powered by Bing, as is Cortana, and Siri and Google Assistant are powered by Google. So both Google and Bing are pretty big players in this space, and so that's worth bearing in mind. So what are the more tangible things that everybody in this room can start doing now besides learning about the technology? What are some of the things you can start exploring today when it comes to voice search? And I want to talk very briefly about just four things. Thinking about your paid search and keywords, thinking about content, thinking about local, and lastly, thinking about how you might get started in developing skills and bots. So we did a piece of research with Microsoft, thank you, Perna, um, to try and understand what are the differences between text-based search and voice-based search, and how might it, it look differently? And the first thing that we've noticed is that there's more question words when it comes to voice search, which is, I think, as you'd expect, people are asking, 
more questions in the context of a digital assistant because it's, after all, a conversation. And so the first piece of advice is to start thinking about question words in your keywords and adding question words to your keywords to test how those, those might work. And think about categorizing those question words according to what they say about consumer intent. So question words like who and what are more likely to suggest that someone's at the top of the funnel and interested in information, whereas question words like where and how are more likely to suggest that someone's at the bottom, ready to convert, and you therefore need to adjust your message accordingly. Second thing is that voice is much more like a conversation. So we don't use an, those sort of truncated versions of search in voice where you type in weather, Stockholm, tomorrow. Instead, you'll say, what will the weather be like on Tuesday when I arrive in Stockholm? So you ask much more of a conversation. And so what we have to think about is adding more phrases and more sentences rather than just snippets of words. So voice searches are longer and likely to become longer over time. So that's the second thing to bear in mind. Third is that, again, seems pretty obvious, voice searches are more, like, more likely to be local. They're three times more likely to be local, mostly because voice search is so mobile. We already said it's likely to be more used on your mobile phone. So again, it's pretty obvious, but make sure you keep all of your data up to date, addresses, phone numbers, opening hours, feeds, maps, all of these sorts of things are really, really critical. It's best practice anyway, but just really make sure that that is in place when you're looking to maximize on voice search. Lastly, think about content. So if you look at voice queries and understand what people are searching for for your brand, you then, of course, want to have content to match. When we think about a text-based world, a consumer asks a question and they get, I don't know, 10 options for relevant content that they might look at. In a voice world, I ask a question, there's only one answer. And so you want to make sure it's your brand that's the right answer. And you do that by making sure your content is relevant and optimized for voice search. Lastly, let's talk about bots, skills, actions. Effectively, they're the new apps. And they're going to become perhaps even more valuable than apps because they'll actively answer a specific consumer need. And so apps are going to become really, really plentiful. Unfortunately, I think many brands are already starting to go down some of the, perhaps, the root of mistakes that we made with apps, creating a bot or a skill without thinking consumer first. So that's really what we would suggest you do is think about, when you think about a skill or building a bot or an app, what is likely to add most value to the consumer. And think about keeping apps, uh, keep, think about keeping bots really simple and clear in terms of what they might do of adding, in va adding value to consumers. And that's important because already we know there are 20,000 skills in the uh, Amazon store, and that's growing at a phenomenal rate and likely to only grow faster. So it's really important that your skill is one that is, is simple and valuable to consumers and is therefore utilized. A recent statistic suggested that only 11% of all of these 20,000 skills are used with any degree of frequency. So they become like mobile apps on your phone where you download loads of them and you only use three or four unless they're really, really valuable. And just to give you an example of what I think is a valuable skill or something that really adds value to a consumer, um, what is one for Domino's Pizza? And what Domino's Pizza did is they created a bot, or skill, action, all the same thing, to do just two things. Allow me to order my favorite pizza, or allow me to order the same pizza that I ordered last time. Really simple, that's all it does. Order me my favorite pizza, please. Really, really simple, very useful for consumers, not trying to do a lot, but just add value. Another example is Expedia. They created just one skill that allows you to ask, what should I pack for my holiday? So they query your holiday, they query the weather, and they tell you, what should you pack for your holiday? So again, keep it really simple and think about what is going to add value to the consumer. Also, interestingly, what Expedia have done is to put lots of extensive information on their website all about 
the skill, how to use it, where to find it, and they're amplifying that in media. And that's going to be important in the future as well when we think about skills and bots and being found. When you think about the huge variety of skills that exist, it'll be important for brands to amplify their efforts to make sure that their skill can be found. So, to summarize, what are the things that you can do now? You can start looking at your keywords and understanding whether there's question words that are surfacing and adjusting your keywords accordingly. You can have a look at your content and make sure that your content is up to date and optimized for voice, for any of that voice traffic that might exist today for you. You should make sure that all your listings are up to date for local, and you can start to explore how you might think about bots and skills as a way of um, adding value to consumers. And if I could leave you with one last thought, it's that when we think about a voice world, we're thinking about absolute hyper-relevancy, about making sure that every single thing we do is hyper-relevant so that when a consumer asks a question, our brand is the one that is, is given the answer. Because essentially, we're going to have to start thinking about not just marketing to consumers, but actually marketing to the machine that becomes the middleman between us and the consumer. Thank you. Thank you so much. We saved the questions for you too. It was very interesting and I think a lot about this. It's hard to see how a voice world will look in the future, I think, and uh, yeah, and how it will affect our day-to-day -day life that we, we see in the future. And we will stay on that topic, I think, and uh, we are, I'm extremely proud to have our next speaker here too. And it's an honor to have her here in Sweden. And she will continue to talk about voice search, AI, and she will talk about yeah, what happens when we don't need our landing page and our apps. What will happen then? That's something that I think a lot about. And I really look forward to listen to Perna Birgi. Welcome on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. So we're going to get into everyone's favorite topic today, which is AI and how it's impacting what all of us will do. But it's early morning-ish still. I'm six hours behind because I'm on US time, so it's very early in the morning for me. So let's wake up by playing a little game. Want to play a game with me? Okay, awesome. It's super simple. I'm going to show you a couple of things, and you have to guess if it was created by an AI or a human. Okay? Let's start with the first one, just a simple poem. And just shout it out if you think human or AI. AI, OK. Anyone else? AI. Most people thinking AI right now? OK, well, this is actually human. <laughs> My colleague Erin wrote this poem I thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> what about this article in the Washington Post? What do you guys think? AI. Yes, it is actually an AI. So the Washington Post has created this article writing bot called Heliograph that can take very fact-based information and turn it into articles. So things like election results or sports scores, um, that can take and turn it into a little article. Kind of cool, but as a former journalist, I'm kind of a little bit horrified, to be honest. <laughs> what about this painting? Any art fans in the room? Can you guess the, the painter? <laughs> Rembrandt, everyone thinks Rembrandt? AI at the back, yes, you would be correct. So this is what happened. The Microsoft research team trained the AI to go and study all the different paintings of Rembrandt. So it looked at his entire body of work and it analyzed things like the subject, the average age, the way they would face the painting, the clothes they would wear. And it was asked to create its own painting. <laughs> Keep... 
So this is unique, this is not real Rembrandt, but you know, the thing that really like blew my mind was if you've ever looked at a painting in real life, have you noticed that you can see the 3D effect of the paint on the canvas? Do you know what I'm talking about? So when this AI printed out its own painting, it layered the ink in such a way to replicate that look of paint on canvas. You guys, it fooled art experts. They were like, oh my gosh, undiscovered work of Rembrandt, how cool. It's just an AI. So as we can see, AI is getting super powerful, it's getting incredibly human-like, and it's changing things for a lot of us. And it's changing how we are interacting as consumers. Let's put away our marketing hat and just think as a regular consumer. How are we behaving? We want to talk to our technology in any way that we can, whether it's typing, whether it's talking, or whether it has screens, no screens, anything we like. I want to show you a little example. This could be your customer. She's relaxing at home in front of her couch with a cup of tea, reading a magazine, and she finds a dress that she likes. Let's take a look at how she's purchasing it. Cortana, I want a dress like this. Can you help me find it? I like this one. Yes, please. Can I get it in a size six? Cool. Cortana, please give them my payment and shipping info. Okay, two questions for you. Did anybody see a landing page? No, no landing page at all. And did you notice the different ways that she was talking? She talked, she typed, she looked at a photo, she did all of that. And that's the biggest impact that AI is having, and that's going to impact all of our jobs today, because AI is turning search multi-sensory. So that's what we'll talk about today. So I want to talk to you about how search is becoming more visual, more tangible, and more audible. So let's get started with the visual. What did we notice in the video? She was looking at the magazine, she liked the dress, she took a photo, and she got an answer. There's nothing easier than that, right? Point and shoot and find what you're looking for. Convenient. But it also solves one more problem. And for that, let me ask you guys, what is that tool called? Does anybody know the name? I don't. I know it just comes with all my IKEA furniture, but <laughs> if I had to go to the store and be like, I want to buy this tool, what would I do? I'd be like, I want a tool that looks like this. It would look so silly. How do you search for something that you don't have the words to describe? That's where image search can come in, because I can take a picture of that, I can upload it, and it will give me the results. So by doing that, search can become far more powerful. And I want to show you some examples of how it's going to impact your discovery. Now, both Google and Bing let you do the same thing. They let you search via typing and via images. Now, there's lots of cool uses for that. I'll give you one of my favorite uses that has no business value whatsoever, but if you upload your photo, you can find your doppelganger. For example, I've done this. <laughs> so I don't know who the evil one is, but probably it's me. <laughs> now, let's think of the business value. Now, Bing does something that no other search engine does. So Google or Yahoo, no one does this, where you can search within an image. So I put up that image of Sweden, and I'm like, oh, I like that star. It looks really nice. Let me zoom in and see what else. So just by zooming in on parts of a picture, I can now get images that are similar just to that part. Yes, this is pretty, but let's think about the impact that this could have on our lives. What if I'm looking at a photograph of a beautiful celebrity? Let's say Taylor Swift. Is she beautiful? Anyway. She's walking around, and she's got a really nice handbag. I'm like, oh, I should really like that handbag. I wonder where she got it from. Zoom in on the picture, and I can discover where, what it is. Everyone becomes a model. And by focusing on optimizing images a little bit more, you can do something that's really powerful. You can do SERP domination. Let's look at this. If I have well-optimized images, I can show up in the image box, 
I can then show up in my regular organic listings. I can have my PPC ad. And I know for Bing, this isn't in Sweden yet, but you could also have the shopping ads. It's coming. If I was suddenly there in all four places, what is the likelihood that I'm going to get the click? Pretty high. So this is what you want to try and do, like take over every aspect of the search that you can. And images are super striking. They jump out. We want to interact with them. So what can you do to try to optimize your images to do well in search? Four simple steps. Step one, make sure you are uploading better quality images. Your product or whatever the, the thing that you want to showcase is has to be really good quality so that the search engine can properly recognize it. It has to be really good lighting, really clear, not too small. You also want to try to optimize the SEO, the, the tags of the images. Now, this hasn't really changed. Optimize the size, put in the image meta tags, the description, the file name, all the simple 101 things in SEO that you used to do. Then make sure you're marking it up. So if you can put in any schema markup for your images, it'll be super helpful in telling us what it's all about so we can show you in more relevant places. And another thing to consider if you haven't is put in an image XML sitemap. These things together can really be super helpful in making sure that the search engine, again, this works for both search engines, can discover your image and show you up in the image search or in the image box on the main search. So try to think about this. But why stop at search? This goes way beyond search as well. Any of you use Pinterest here at all? Yes, so many. Pinterest is fabulous for discovery, and they have this tool called Shop the Look, where you can do exactly that. If I have a photo of a model wearing like maybe a skirt and a, and a shirt, I can zoom in on the shirt and be like, I just want to buy this, and it can let you do that. So this kind of image discovery is going to become normal for your customers because they're seeing it in their social media, they're seeing it in search. They can even walk down the street, and if I'm like, oh, I really like that handbag, it's so pretty, where can I buy it from? Take a picture, get an answer. The fancy handbag is available at porno.com for $60. Very handy. So anyone is a model. It's not just the people on your website. I could walk around, and I could really like Lisa's shoes. I'm like, oh, I wonder where Lisa got those shoes. I don't know her, so I don't maybe want to ask her. I can be creepy and take a picture. <laughs> Don't do it in a creepy way, but you can. So the key lesson for this is give your audience plenty of ways to discover you and engage with you. So let's get talk about the tangible a little bit. And for that, I want to share with you my favorite stat. So according to Gardner, by 2020, the average person will have more conversations with their bot than with their spouse. My husband is very eagerly waiting for 2020. <laughs> I'm like, no, honey, I'll just create a bot that will nag you. Great. So, but bots are super helpful. And I know, I know the stat can seem unbelievable because we've all had that frustrating experience with a bot. Yes, I'm not the only one, right? The next gen of bots will use empathy and ease to make it a lot better. Let me show you an actual example. And we've all traveled. We all have booked travel online. Anyone use the Skyscanner website? OK, a few of us. I mean, it's great. It's just like any of the other websites. They have coming up with a chatbot that's super cool. So if you go to the Skyscanner chatbot, it says, hey, I'm the chatbot. This is what I can do. I can help you book travel. So I had my friends Nancy and Michael, because I know that they wanted to travel to Iceland. I'm like, hey, Nancy and Michael, please can you use this for me and send me screenshots? So they did. So Nancy went and talked to it, and it said, I want to book flights. Where do you want to go? I want to go to Reykjavik. So it's starting to ask her questions in a very friendly, personal way. Well, Nancy, where are you going to fly from? She said, oh, I'll fly from DC, because she lives in Washington, DC. So the chatbot says, OK, let me go look at when do you want to fly? And if you notice, it says, when are you planning to travel? And that thing right there, the different dates, it's a carousel, it's a slider. So it's just giving her proactively different dates and different pricing. So in case she was flexible, she could see the different prices for different dates. Really helpful. So she selected one date range that worked for her, and it says, all right, I'm going to go and look for this flight right now. 
And then it came up with a list of different flights that she could take. Again, it was a slider, just the top three or four. Have you ever tried to book flights with more than one person? And you're like, no, 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 look at this one. No, look at that flight. Have you, anyone tried that? Yeah, not that fun. Because you can be like, no, I'm looking at the third entry. No, that is not the third entry. That is the third entry. We've had that experience. So she has this list of flights for the dates. She can just bring in her husband and add him to the chat and they can take a look. So Michael added Skyscan and Nancy to this group. Now you can both be in the same bot and start looking at different flights and then pick the one you book. What do you guys think? Pretty simple? Exactly. So in our research at Microsoft, we found that a chatbot just has to hit three criteria. Step one. It has to solve the user's problem in the minimum number of steps. Let's think back to the Skyscanner bot. Did it do that? Mm -hmm. It has to be easier than the alternative. Why would I use a chat bot if the website is super easy? Right? We're competing with our own selves for what people will use to interact with us. So it has to be easier, and it has to be really intuitive. People have to know how to interact with the app. If we think about this checklist, the Skyscanner bot hit all of them. And it's not just the Skyscanner. There's so many wonderful chatbots out there that exist. Sephora has one. Um, QVC in the US has a really good one. There's tons of great bots. 1-800-Flowers is a really good one. So check those out. And by adding bots, yes, it makes consumers' life easier. We can also make search much more powerful. And I'm going to show you a search result, and I want you to tell me what's different about it. So take a look. And Hopefully, at the back, you can see, OK, do you notice anything different in this SERP? You spotted it? Yeah. Exactly. So this is something that's an early pilot. I got permission to share this with you all. Now, if you're trying to go and book different restaurants, and maybe you've got questions like, is there parking, or can I bring my dog? You may have to go to the website and look around. But how about if the business could make the searcher's life easier? It could give you the answers right there in the SERP. Again, you can test this out on your desktop at home, by the way. This is Monsoon Sp Seattle is live for anyone. If I click that, I can get a little Skype button come up, the little box, and I can ask it questions right there. Super cool. For example, and it, it knows how to answer the question in different ways. So if Joelle asked, like, is your restaurant pet friendly? Or I said, can I bring my dog? It would know that it meant the same thing. It would give me the same answer. It's early pilot. It's fun. You can try to break it. <laughs> you can, because it's early pilot. Or you can ask it simple things, and it's helpful. Now, because this is an early pilot, it's only available for restaurants in Seattle, but I still wanted to share it with you because this is something that's coming. We're making the SERPs conversational. There's another thing that we are testing, which is a chat extension that's part of the PPC or, or, or SEM ads. So if you look, and I'm sorry, it's a really tiny screenshot. If you look at what's circled under that ad, it says, chat with this bot now. And if I click that, again, the same experience, I can go ahead and ask it questions. And how this chat extension works is that you give us a list of 50 to 100 questions in an Excel file. You don't have to code, and we'll create the bot for you. Now, this is super valuable because by the very nature of PPC, you can create questions for every stage of the funnel. So let's think about this. What if I was a, so, uh, a store that sold cameras? I can anticipate that maybe your question to me would be higher in the funnel, like, what's the difference between DSLR and point and shoot? Or maybe what's the best camera for a 16-year-old? Those would be higher in the funnel. And maybe your question to me would be mid in the funnel, that what's better, Kodak or Nikon? Which one should I buy? Or which is the best camera for night shoots? You see, it's a bit more influencing. And then at the final stage, when I'm trying to decide whether I should buy from you or not, the question could be, what's your return policy? Do you price match? So in that same 50 to 100 list of questions, you could make sure that you were able to answer all the questions that could come up in the different stages. How cool is that? I 
think that's going to make your customer's life so much easier. And as a result, they will love you more. You'll be the brand that stands out if you can make them easier. But again, we're not always going to want to type, because sometimes we can't use our hands, whether we're driving or doing something else, or as Shonda, uh, as Shonda wonderfully talked about, voice search is going to be quite important. Now, Shanda covered everything absolutely perfectly. I just want to add on a quick point, which is a question that I get asked all the time. How do I optimize for Bing? Well, the answer right now is Bing just ranks voice search in a very similar algorithm to how we rank regular uh, organic results. It's not that different. But to give you some more context, I want to share with you the three different sources that Bing uses to pull data from, and I believe the other engines may operate quite similarly. So if I did a search for things to do in Stockholm, you'd get three types of information. The first one on top would come from structured data. That's what you provide to us with your markup. Then we get unstructured data, which is what we pull from your websites as part of the organic listing. And then we create it and put it in order. And then we have the knowledge graph, or what we call Satori knowledge data at Microsoft. That's when we can take all of the structured and unstructured data and come up with verified answers that address all the nouns, so like the names, the places, and the relationship between each of them. So to put that into context, if I had to ask Cortana a question such as, hey, Cortana, what's the capital of Germany? There's one proper answer. She'll pull it from the knowledge graph, and she'll be like, well, Perna, it's Berlin. But what if I asked her a question that maybe did not have one clear answer? For example, What's the greatest rock band in history? Now, if I had to ask you, or you, or you, you'd all have different answers, I'm guessing, unless there's like one clear band that everyone loves. No. For this, Cortana may choose to give me an answer or choose to give me SERPs. She may not speak one answer. So here, she'll, be, she'll give me a list of SERPs and allow me to choose from. So for example, she'll give me a list of different sites, and then I can scroll through. You see, it makes sense. So if you can follow Shanda's advice on creating more and more content that hits some of this, then you have the chance of getting that one true answer or the, the knowledge box, and then that will help you be served as the answer more often. Again, voice goes beyond just the search. We talked about digital assistants, and a cool thing that we're seeing with assistants is that all of them are able to recognize who is speaking now, which is a huge benefit. If you have Netflix, it's so much easier when you have people's profiles, because you know what, it knows what my husband likes, it knows what my son likes, it knows what I like, so I get different recommendations. The voice assistants are going to be able to do the same thing now. And Cortana is taking it one step further when it can recognize the difference between a, an adult and a child. So then all the thing, times that my son has tried to order pizza all the time from Domino's, as, the app, it will be able to recognize it and know that it shouldn't just keep bringing pizza all the time to my house. <laughs> and it's because children have different needs, and you need to respond to children in a different way. So I think just from an ethical standpoint, that's a wonderful thing to do. But it's also quite helpful from a marketing standpoint. So again, these assistants, Shanda already explained this, but I can talk to it quickly, like, hey, Cortana, ask Skyscanner if my flight to Edinburgh is on time. It's so easy. We'll start asking it to help with all of the different life admin, or ask Domino's to place my easy order. Yeah, does my son does this too much? Let's change password. <laughs> or if I had something break in my house, I could call a plumber. Say, hey, Cortana, ask Talk Local that I need a plumber to repair my water heater. So cool. And what we can do as marketers, as we're creating and programming our skills, people are talking to us. They're telling us what they want in their own words. So what should we do as marketers? Learn and remember, and use it to shape this conversation. So let me give you an example. I was, recent, I was in Italy last week, and every time I go there, I always buy a ton of shoes, because I have a problem. So <laughs> I love shoes too much. So what if, and I always go to the same shoe shop, so what if the shop knew that, okay, yes, Purna is here in Italy again, we'll make lots of profit, I'm really good for the Italian economy. So <laughs> they could say that, if it knew I was coming, it could say, Ciao, Porta, Italian shoe store has a new range of boots. Would you like to look at some pics? I mean, that's, that's quite helpful. 
So of course I would say, yes, of course, show me some pictures. And it would say, okay, I'll email it to you now, but by the way, you could save 15% if you order today, because it knows I'm cheap and I like things on discount, <laughs> if you use the code Bing. But hurry, this code expires in 24 hours. So like any normal human being, what would I do? I'd say thank you and then run to the store and buy all the shoes. <laughs> It's changed the conversation. It's made it all about me. It's far more personalized. I think overall, as consumers, we're fed up of advertising. We're installing ad blockers at greater rates than ever. Our marketing needs to become relationship-based, and conversation can help you create these relationships because it changes the conversation, quote unquote, from buy now, buy now, hit you on the head, to what do you need? How can I help you? Exactly like shoe store, it was really trying to sell me shoes, but it phrased it in such a way that I felt it was being quite helpful. Yes, I'd like to look at shoes. Yes, I'd like a discount. How nice of you, shoe store, but it worked. Now, so the key lesson from this is you want to remove any friction in the process and work to increase relevance via personalization. So to wrap up, I want to give you some handy resources. If people are not sure, how do I create a bot? I have a whole list of pretty much every single place that you can go to create a bot. There's, of course, links from Microsoft, which I have used and can vouch for. But I also put links for, for Google and Facebook and Slack as well in case. Now, if any of you are not sure how to create a bot, you want to create one without any coding skills at all, like me, I have zero coding knowledge, you can use qnamaker.ai to create a bot in less than 10 minutes with no coding needed. Again, you guys will get these slides later, I believe. So let's recap. You want to optimize your visuals for better discoverability and engagement. You want to use chatbots to make life easier for your audience. And you want to teach your assistant skills. And you want to be sure to make it personal. So talk so much. I can't say <laughs> Thank you so much. So interesting. Så Lisa, nu går vi över till det svenska här. Eh, vi har faktiskt tid för eh, frågor och man kan vinna ett pris här då. Så eh, Lisa, jag tänkte hjälpa oss åt här och se vem tillsammans med Task Force och se vem som ställer bästa frågor. Oh, eh, så vi här är priset. Oh, det här fint paket får man med sig som ställer bästa frågan. Så nu när vi har så många specialister här. We have so many knowledgeable people here, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand now. It's morning, I know, and we are <laughs> in Sweden still, but <laughs> I'm sure you have at least a couple of questions here for Alicia or Purna. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I've had people do both. So um, the question, if everyone could hear it, right, was should I just have a separate sitemap for images? So I've had clients do both, where they have a definitely a separate just JPEG image sitemap that makes sure that every time there's a new image added to the site, it updates. Or you can do it as part of your regular sitemap as well. So you can try it whichever way is easier for you. The fact that you're at least doing it is going to be really helpful for you. But yeah. No, you're very welcome. Thank you. We have another question. Someone else in the competition, you must have. None more frågor. Because it's so obvious, everything. I think it's. What I think about what about branding in the when it's just voice? I think that's my big question. I don't know if it. Ooh, you want to answer it? Yeah, because I've actually been working with some brands on that. Sorry to like jump in with that, but um, ooh, I'll send this way so I'm not having my back to you. So branding is going to be even more important in this new age of voice. Because think about this. If you had to say Cortana, Assistant, Alexa, anybody, say, how much are flights to Paris this weekend? They'll give you a list of like multiple different websites. If you use Google Assistant or Cortana, she'll give you a list of different websites. But what if I said, Hey, Cortana, ask Expedia how much are flights to Paris this weekend? If I knew they had a skill and the skill was easy to use, 
I would then just go into the Expedia's conversion funnel, and the chances of me buying from Expedia are much higher than anyone. So if you have a skill and a bot, overcome the discoverability issue that Shanda was talking about and make sure that people know that you have the skill and the bot so they come find you and ask for you by name. So that's going to be really important. I would say one other thing, yeah. I would say one other thing about uh, branding when it, when it comes to voice, and that is that when you first ask your digital, when you first ask your digital assistant a question, so you're here, so you maybe say, I don't know, buy me some dog food, and you choose the brand Purina dog food, for example. But over time, your digital assistant learns your behavior, so when you say buy dog food, it automatically in time will buy the Purina. So I think actually, it will be true to say this is probably a first mover advantage, that if you can make your brand really well known uh, and become commonplace to the skill, that is, is likely to be a benefit. Oh, one more question. Uh, it's for Alicia. Hmm? Uh, uh, the Google, uh, the Google attribution would be able to be used in bid strategies, right? And will it will it will it be able to be used in in DS and account for different touch touch points in other uh, disciplines? Uh, you mean other than search? Yeah, d like different from now, where it only uses within DS and within search, like use, like like the example, like use uh, uh, different attributions depending on if a video has been involved as a touch point or not. Right, that's a good question. Honest answer is I don't know the specific answer to that question, whether or not you will be it on on search channels. Search. Um, and it may be a possibility to check back to you, your name <laughs> after the session. Uh, but um, what I do want to mention is that there is actually a schedule of uh, features added over So even if it's not a feature that you thought of now, I'm happy to provide value. It is valuable to lots of other. Not all bidding capabilities are going to be available right out of the gate, but they're going to be added to the develop. That's good. Do we have one more question? More questions? How many of you have used voice search? Det är, ganska, det är ganska tidigt, du kanske säger att det är... <laughs> precis, jo väl använder ja. Jag gissar att utvecklingen kommer gå fort, så känner jag i alla fall. Bara man kommer över tröskeln och börjar använda det så kommer man liksom... Använda ja, men precis. Jag sa att vi var lågstegare före och var datadrivna redan. Det känns som att vi har mycket att jobba på ändå. <laughs> ja, inga fler frågor, då ska vi inte pressa er mer. Nej. Precis. Vad säger du? Jag tycker den som liksom vågade först få priset. Ja, absolut. Du får presentera ja, dig. Ja, Martina. Martina från PhD. Ja, ah, varsågod. Eh, presentationerna kommer också läggas upp på IABs webbplats. Så att, eh, hoppas att ni tar med er lite härifrån. Och Gå gärna in dit och om ni vill gräva djupare i det som har tagits upp idag. Super, tack för idag och eh, som sagt, ta trapporna ner så ni inte halkar nu, säger jag bara. <laughs> så tack för idag och tack, tack. alla talare. Så thank you so much for coming. Tack, tack.